resident, Art Sheridan, recalled his long history in the music business with Fox Valley Music Foundation's Steve Warrenfeltz in July of 2015. In 1945, after his World War II service, Sheridan, shown here on the left, went to work for his father, who owned a manufacturing company on South Michigan Avenue in Chicago. And my father, a very industrious kind of guy, liked to do everything in his own plant. But we found an engineer that helped us build a record pressing plant because at the end of the Second World War, there weren't too many facilities to press records. Only the major record companies had facilities. So we set up a small plant to demonstrate how phonograph records were being made in those years. And in turn, we would take contract pressing from other record companies locally just to show how the plant would run and to uh, justify its existence. I started out, uh, I think, making uh, pressing records for Aristocrat Records, which subsequently became Chess Records. But by having the plant, that got me involved in the record industry. I subsequently opened up the record distributing company on Michigan Avenue that was then became Record Row with my distributing company, Mercury, distributing King Records. Ultimately, Chess was there. Chess bought Aristocrat Records from Evelyn and Chuck Aaron, and Evelyn became Art's partner in American Record Distributors. American was on the record row stretch of South Michigan Avenue, where artists would come in and talk to Art about recording. Popular bands were doo-wop bands like the Moonglows and Flamingos, along with blues musicians, Homesick James, J.B. Hutto, John Lee Hooker, and Jimmy Reed. The distribution of phonograph records, particularly in the rhythm and blues area, uh, was a very important issue in getting artists to come to you because they wanted the exposure and they wanted to be uh, recorded with companies that would have their records <coughs> distributed throughout the country because that would begin uh, the uh, series of personal appearances that they would get. Art started Chance Records in 1950 in his offices on South Michigan. When it closed in 1954, his assistant, Ewart Abner, went to work for VJ Records. Uh, I became involved with Jimmy and Vivian Bracken, who are the VJ of VJ Records, when I was pressing their records also. And that's how I got to distribute some of the early artists that they had. VJ was an African-American-owned business, with Art in the role as silent partner and ultimately Ewart Abner becoming president of the label. In 1962, Duke of Earl by Gene Chandler became VJ's first million-dollar selling record, and it almost wasn't released. Well, the almost wasn't is something that occurs quite often in the record business, because when you go into a session, in those years particularly, uh, you had the right to do four sides in a recording session. And I think it was a four-hour session under the rules of the union. And Petrillo ran a pretty strict union. So uh, uh, Bunky Carter, who was uh, Vivian's brother, was our A&R man, artist and repertoire person, and he did most of the recordings that were done. And so of the four sides at that particular time, and I don't remember what the others were, uh, that didn't seem to be the most logical one that we would release. But after sitting and talking about it and listening to it, and you got kind of deaf after a while trying to decide what sides you were going to release, that was decided to be the side. And when you sent them out to the disc jockeys to get them played on the air, they were the ones that usually picked the side that either became a hit or didn't become a hit. Art went on to describe a certain practice common in the music promotion business. Payola was part of uh, the way you promoted your records. 
in the sense that you did favors for disc jockeys. Sometimes you brought them uh, candy. Uh, you might bring them a bottle of booze. Uh, occasionally somebody would get paid or you did a favor for somebody. But that's basically how you try to get your record promoted as opposed to Johnny Jones. In the early 1950s, Al Benson was the premier DJ for R&B in Chicago, hosting shows on WGES, WJJD, and WAAF. He was inducted into the Rhythm and Blues Hall of Fame in 2017. Art had a short stint as a DJ at WGRY in Gary, Indiana, where Vivian Carter had a regular show, and in 1953 founded Chicago-based VJ Records with her husband, Jimmy Bracken. After Duke of Earl, VJ went on to produce hits by the Four Seasons, Sherry, Big Girls Don't Cry, and Walk Like a Man. Around this time, VJ was also trying to obtain distribution rights to country artist Frank Ifield, who was born in England but had moved to Australia at a young age. Ifield led them to a very curious deal basically an accident. As you said, we were in London. Uh, we were touring in many countries in Europe at that time to expand the distribution and become acquainted. And we went to London with uh, uh, Abner, myself, Jimmy, and a lawyer that we knew from New York that had connections in the industry. I don't recall his name. But we met with the people at EMI with the idea of trying to get Frank Ifield because we wanted to expand the, the white side of the label. And uh, during the meeting they said, we have a young group that's beginning to make some noises here in England. Uh, actually they bumped some people off a plane just to get them on and so on, things like that. And if you take them on, because again distribution was important and we had, VJ had great distribution throughout the states and in some foreign countries. Um, you could have Frank Ifield, or re the rights to Frank Ifield to release his records. So we said, sure, and that's simply how we wound up with the Beatles. The Beatles material, as we heard it in those early years, was not our genre. And so it was reluctantly that we released it to begin with because we didn't quite fit into what we were producing and releasing. And uh, subsequently we did release the LP. And I think it sold probably, I may be incorrect, but maybe something like 3,200 copies, which is infinitesimal in the, in the real estate industry. And then we didn't pay much attention to it, in addition to not paying the royalties promptly and things like that that we should have at EMI. So they were able to move it back to Capital, who then wanted to pick it up uh, because they'd gotten on to the Ed Sullivan show and became a big hit. Formed in 1953, VJ became the most successful black-owned record label in the United States. In 1964, they sold more than 2.5 million Beatles singles. Art's career had started with manufacturing records, and he reminisced with Steve about the process. I would tell you if I were younger, I'd probably go back in the business of manufacturing phonograph records. Now, they're made somewhat differently than in my day because they were just originally the old shellac records and they were made on a press. Uh, the material was placed in the middle of a, of a, uh, a, a die thing with you know, one side attached to the top and the other side to the bottom. And the material was put in there that was closed and then hot steam was put through pipes to melt the shellac and that's how you made a phonograph record. And then of course vinyl came along uh, after that, and we began using vinyl for it. Shellac uh, being used primarily for 78 RPM records? Yeah. Originally, they tried to do 33 and a third, but they, they just wouldn't hold up as well. In fact, the test of uh, how good the material was in our plant, and the materials came from a company in, I think it was Pennsylvania, Biddy and Smith. Uh, and. Uh, my office was up on the second floor of that building, and we'd throw a pressed record down the steps. If it didn't break, we knew they had a good batch of material. You know, if it didn't, we'd send it back to the manufacturer. Born in Chicago in 1925, 
Art was 12 years old when the first Bluebird record sessions took place in Aurora at the Leland Sky Club. What does he remember? No, I knew of Bluebird Records, of course. We had very limited uh, manufacturers or uh, producers of records, RCA, Bluebird, and so on. But the first I knew of the Leland Hotel was after the Second World War. I lived in Chicago, and uh, I think my first secretary uh, family lived in Aurora, but I remember driving out from Chicago to go to the uh, nightclub at the top of the Leland Hotel just for entertainment and just the idea of looking back at the city of Chicago to see the lights along the way. From Aurora to Chicago it was pretty dark in those days because there all these sub, uh, suburbs hadn't developed to the degree they are now. And it was a long trip. We didn't have expressways. I think we came out Ogden Avenue. Art's experience with the recording musicians led him to the nightclub business. When we had the record labels, we often liked to go places that played our kind of music. And uh, we liked jazz, and we liked blues. But there weren't too many places for black people to very comfortably go and enjoy that kind of music other than on 63rd Street in Chicago where there were a series of clubs like the Crown Propeller Lounge was basically a, a black nightclub, often one we used in which to have rehearsals prior to a recording session. Uh, so in discussions one day with uh, Jimmy and Abner, we thought we'd like to have a club. So we originally went to uh, I think it was the Maryland Hotel in downtown, near, near North Side, Chicago. They had a uh, club in the basement. Uh, Ramsey Lewis started there playing. And we understood it wanted, they wanted to sell it. And uh, we thought about buying it, but the, uh, the local uh, influence were not particularly pleasant for us at that time, particularly uh, having black owners. So we didn't do that, and ultimately we got involved with uh, Al Grossman, who had the Gate of Horn on the north side of Chicago, and we found that there was a club that had been vacated on Dearborn and Division that had been kind of a uh, playhouse for a group, and it was empty, and we thought that maybe we could start a uh, jazz club there, primarily for young people, kids and so on. So we contacted the owner who happened to live out here in DuPage County. I think his name was Big Bill Johnson, Mr. Johnson. And he owned the building. There was a restaurant on the first floor. There was this huge space that had been a theater up on the second floor. Uh, live theater, not a movie theater. He owned the movie theater across the street also. In any event, uh, we decided we would see if we could you know, rent the place, and ultimately I negotiated some deals with him, and we got to rent the place. It sat 400 people. Uh, it had some tables and chairs that the other folks had left in there, a uh, big stage. And so we opened what we thought would be a teenage nightclub to begin with. Uh, I remember that we had the first dollar changing machine, and everything in it were vending machines. So they could change the dollars and go into the vending machines. Had no liquor. We suddenly realized it certainly wasn't going to work that way because we had some, uh, you know, pretty good jazz acts at that time. And uh, so ultimately we decided that we had to have liquor and change the attitude. But we didn't want to lose the. Uh, the idea we had of trying to get young people involved. So we ultimately applied for a liquor license. And what we did in the club, in that club, since it was so big, we split the room so that we had one side where you had to enter and get checked and so on to uh, sit and get liquor. And the other side, you couldn't get liquor and there was about wide space in the middle so they couldn't hand things across and there was a chain that went down the middle of the club. And uh, that's how we opened what was called Birdhouse on Dearborn and Division. 
then after that, if anybody knows Butch's nightclub came along on the first floor around the corner, and uh, that was our first club. And we booked some very important uh, jazz acts in there, They're all the name acts at those times. And one interesting thing was uh, with that club, I remember trying to get Thelonious Monk to play, and he was rather reluctant to leave New York and come to Chicago. Finally convinced him to come, and he liked to play ping pong. And our publicist at that time was a small little Japanese girl. And she played ping pong. So we set up a ping pong table in that space in the middle. And between sets, he and the young lady whose name I can't recall would play ping pong. And that kept him happy, along with some pretty powerful rum that he liked to drink, I remember. I took one swig, and that was the end of my trying that rum. But that was the birdhouse. A seasoned club owner, Art also opened a Dixieland club in Chicago and featured Jimmy McPartland's quartet as the opening act. For about three, four years, we owned the Sutherland, Basin Street, and the Birdhouse. Miles played the Sutherland many times. He was, we had one building, I remember Miles Davis and Nancy Wilson when she first started. Nancy worked for us quite often, and she was a good friend and great artist. Uh, Slappy White, uh, Almost any jazz artist that you name played there or at the Birdhouse. Steve wrapped up his conversation with Art Sheridan, asking him about the way music was made back in his day versus today. It kind of cracks me up a little bit. I rem remember the first recording studios we had, uh, Universal. And then as I went around the country, I would record in St. Louis or Memphis or wherever the artist happened to be. Because you kind of followed the artist around and uh, we had a control uh, room, small control room. Uh, we had six channels, that was a lot. Everybody recorded by and large in the same room. Tracks came later, you know. I remember uh, back up in Universal, two really kind of funny things as you look back on it. For example, the first echo chamber was the women's washroom in the penthouse of the Civic Opera Building. It was one of those kind of industrial looking washrooms, you know, all tile. And uh, Bill and Bernie put a microphone at one end and a speaker at the other and a guard on the door. And that became the first echo chamber when they were recording because they could modulate that as long as nobody got in the washroom. And I remember Bill's wife sitting up there. We were recording on large discs. <laughs> 